Good morning, Rising Star, and good morning to all those that are streaming live with us. We praise the Lord that you're here in the house of, of God and um, coming to worship with us here at Rising Star. Right now it's our prayer time, and we do have a list of prayer requests. We're going to give uh, everyone an opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and get our minds set. Let us go before the throne of grace. Father God, we come before you as your word commands us to. We come before you entering into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. So we say thank you on this morning, Father God. We praise you and you worship you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to come boldly before your throne of grace with our prayer requests and our petitions. Father God, you know what we have need of. You know what each one of us needs, how we need to fill your grace, your mercy, your favor. So Lord, we come to you praising you and thanking you for the baptism that we had last week, Father God. We lift up our sick and our shut in, Lord Jesus. We're not going to name all the names, but Father God, you know what Bob and Kim and Donna and Jocelyn and all of our members have been going through, Father God. We trust you and we praise you and we thank you because we've seen a miracle in their lives, Father God. We've seen you do a miracle in Diane's life and in Jennifer's life. Not just their lives, Father God, but ours too. Certain things that you have done that we know no one else could do but you. So Father God, we trust you and we thank you and we praise you and we bring these other petitions to you, Father God. We just had a young lady that was just murdered, 13 years old, Father God. We lift up her family. We lift them up to you, Father God, that only you can give comfort. Only you can save their souls, Father God. This thing that has happened to their family has happened to many families. But Lord, we bring it to you. We lay it down to you, Father God because we trust and we believe that out of this incident, someone, someone will get to know you. They will have a closer walk with you. It's unfortunate that a 13-year-old has to lose their life for our lives to change for the better, to get to know you. But Father God, you have your hands on us, Lord. So we come crying out to you, Father God, that you touch those that do not know you, that you give them a reason to live, Father God. Those that don't understand what your love is about, help us to be those witnesses to show and share what you have done in our lives, Father God. Lord, we lift up those that are incarcerated, Lord Jesus. You know what they have need of, you know what they have done, and you have forgiven them. Let them reach out to you, Father God. Let them cry out to you, Father God. Lord, we believe that you are our miracle worker. We believe that you can save us, not just our soul, but save us within the day. Keep us away from the enemy, Father God. Lord, so we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to come before your throne of grace boldly. We all go through problems. We all have trying times. But Lord, we believe that you are our way maker. We believe, Father God, that you have the government in your hands. We lift them up to you, Father God. Lord, we lift up those that are grieving, those that are sick, those that are in need of healing, those that believe that they don't have no way to go, nowhere to turn to. But Father God, you are our way maker. You are our promise keeper. 
you said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Father God, we look to you because you know all about us. You know all of our circumstances. You know what we have need of. So we put it in your hands, Father God. This day, this time, we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you because we believe that you will make a way for us, Father God. Whatever our chaos is, our circumstances are, you are there in the midst. So Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We can't praise you enough and thank you enough for all the things that you've done for us. Lord, we praise you for this time. We praise you for the pastor and his family, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you touch the man of God, that your word go forth, that the scales come off of our eyes and off of our ears, that we may hear what thus saith the Lord. You said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in. So Father God, we invite you in our lives our everyday lives, Father God, we invite you in. We invite you into this service that you may be glorified, that we will honor you and praise you and thank you and that we see that you are that promise keeper. We have the victory. Those that believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life have the victory. Let us live like we have victory in you, Father God. Lord Jesus, we praise you, we thank you, we worship you, we honor you. We give this service over to you that someone may come and say, what must I do to be saved? Father God, we lift up those that are hurting. We lift up those that are in need of just knowing what to do next. Financial problems, family problems. Father God, we pray and we ask that they believe that you are a keeper, that you are a healer, and that you can resolve our circumstances. We lift you up, Father God, and we believe in you because you know all about us. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and praise God. Good morning, good morning. Well, it's another day. Are we gonna be glad and rejoice in it? Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome you, good morning, and all those who are tuned in via media, we welcome you as well. Well, it's time for our scripture-led prayer. And I'm going to be sharing from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where it reads, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, 
whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, as always, we come before you to give you the praise and honor and glory that is due your name. Oh, Father God, Heavenly Father, we praise your name for the Lord Jesus, who is the word of life. Oh, Father, thank you that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Oh, Father, how wonderful <laughs> that John saw the Lord with his own eyes, lived with him, and learned from him. No, oh, Father, on that glorious day when we who are in Christ will also see Jesus face to face. Oh, we thank you, Lord, with a glorious thought. Oh, if I may borrow from the song, <laughs> I can only imagine, I can only imagine what it would be like. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel Oh, Lord God, will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Oh, Father, what a glorious time. We know it will be. And so, Father, we thank you for the witness and testimony of your holy apostles and prophets who were faithful to the truth that they received through whom we have come to a saving knowledge that Christ is the Messiah and Savior of the world. Thank you. In whom we have received the forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. We thank you. Oh, Father, we praise and thank you for Jesus. We glorify his name and praise you for the good news of the gospel of grace. And so, Father, help us to walk in spirit and truth and remain in fellowship with our heavenly Lord. We thank you for sending Jesus to be the Lord of our life, the light of our soul, and the joy 
of our heart. We thank you. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, in his holy, precious name, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Amen. Let us worship the King this morning. Let's give our Lord yeah. and Savior Jesus Christ Hallelujah. all the glory, honor, and praise this morning. It is so good to be here in the house of the Lord. And just a reminder, we're not on a Zoom call. This is an interactive praise and worship. We are not here to perform. We are here to, per to praise and to worship our King. Yesterday, we uh, were able to uh, be a part of, our church was, some of our members were able to come on out and be a part of the March for Jesus uh, celebration yesterday at Wick Park. How many of you were able to just see it, even if it was online or there in person? All right, so it was a ma an amazing experience because you would want to think that because it was raining, everything would be canceled. Oh, we should do this. Oh, we should change this or change that. Yes, we had to cover up the electrical ports and all of these things, but guess what? We were reminded yesterday that Jesus, the theme of the event was Jesus reigns. Right. And so that rain was a reminder that yeah. Jesus yeah. reigns. Hallelujah. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And we did not let the rain stop us. And that is a symbol of how we cannot let the distractions of this world distract us from, from what we should be doing as we are on mission with Christ. So whether rain, whether, whether sunshine, thunderstorm, avalanche, whatever it may be in our lives, we still have the responsibility of giving God all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. So if you have arms, wave them. If you have legs, move them, because there's somebody who does it, right? right? So we should be giving God all the glory, honor, and praise. Let's rise this morning. Our hands are lifted up, and our heart is ready to receive a blessing from you, Lord Jesus. Yes, yes.
a blessing from you. Oh, a blessing from you. A blessing from you.
are the reason why we breathe. Yes. Yes. You are the reason why we live. Yes. Oh, there are so many things going on in this world right now. Yes, yes, Lord. In the world, in the streets, in our homes, in our hearts. You, Lord Jesus, are the reason why we breathe. Every word that comes out of our mouth. Thank you, Lord. Every Thank thought you. that comes to our minds. Thank you, Jesus. Should be in honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we all struggle. Yeah. Every single one of us. Want to be mindful that he is the reason why we live, why we breathe. This goes out to the world. This goes out to the stress. Sorting out a million thoughts running through your head to everyone.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The song says that we have breath. The scripture says if the rocks are silent, well, if we won't give them praise, turn me down, son. Because we have breath, we have the opportunity to give praise to our God. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you that we have breath to say thank you. The song says, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. We praise you because of who you are. We praise you because you are the Alpha and the Omega. We praise you because even when we are faithless, you remain faithful. We praise you because when there's chaos all around us, you are Jehovah Shalom, the God who gives peace. We praise you because you are still a healer. We praise you because you are still a miracle worker. There is nothing that is too hard for you. We praise you because of who you are. So Lord, we honor you this morning. Thank you so much for being in our midst. Lord God, we ask right now that your spirit would continue to reign in this place. We thank you that you're a God who does not abandon us. Even in our rebellion, you continue to chase after us. Your goodness is running after us. Lord, we love you. Your goodness runs after us. So Lord, as we Prepare to open your word where you continue to smile on us with your presence. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Where's Sister Leslie? Les, I got a request. Sing the CC windings, uh, running, your goodness is running after me, whatever that song, you know what I'm talking about. There's a times when we need to not rush in our worship, but just remain in his presence, amen. Son, the mic, please. stand together and worship with her. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice.
goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. Says, for the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Verse 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. You may be seated. Last week, we spent time looking over the marks of a great leader. We had four points on last week, and we'll continue this morning to complete chapter 12 in 1 Samuel. The first thing we saw was in verses 1 and 2, and that is great leaders are sensitive to God's voice. We don't rush into his presence. In fact, we prepare to be in his presence. The priest, it was unthinkable for them to rush into the presence of God because they understood that God was holy. There was preparation that was necessary and God's leaders must be sensitive to his voice, and there is so much chaos and so much noise going on around us. If we're not careful, we will hear the voices of people and not hear the voice of God. He says in verse 1 of chapter 12, I have listened to your voice and all that you have said to me. 
and I have appointed a king over you. Samuel is old man. He's an old man at this point, and he is passing the baton. And so he leads with us some principles for leadership. First of all, great leaders are sensitive to God's voice. Secondly, great leaders lead with integrity. Not only do they say the right thing, they do the right thing. They practice what they preach. Samuel asked him, if I've, have I done anything? Have I stolen from you? Have I done anything that would cause you to question my authority? In other words, he's saying that I have lived a life of integrity. I'm not perfect, but I've lived a life of integrity before you. That's what great leaders do. They live, they live and they lead with integrity. Leaders should not be asking you to do something that they are not themselves doing. That is hypocritical for me to ask you to come to Bible study when I don't show up at Bible study. You invite me to come to Sunday school and I'm looking around to find you and you're nowhere to be found. Great leaders lead with integrity. Thirdly, Great leaders remind the people of God's faithfulness. There are times when we need to just remember all the things that God has done for us. Quite often we come with our hands out, but we need to come with our hands up. The song says, my hands are lifted up, my heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. There are times when we need to be reminded of how faithful God is. When you're going through the difficult times and in the valley experience of life, instead of feeling sorry for yourself, just start right making a list of all the things that God has done for you. He'll turn your mourning into praise. Even when your circumstances haven't changed, you begin to praise God because you remember how faithful he was in the past and it'll give you some encouragement for the future. Great leaders remind the people of God's faithfulness. When we were faithless, when we were less than Holy and righteous, he continued to pour out his love on us. In fact, the song says, your goodness is running after us. That's the Hebrew word hesed, which means it's loyal love. No matter what you do, God still loves you, and he is still going to pursue you with his loyal love. And so great leaders remind the people of God's faithfulness. And then fourth, we saw that great leaders convey the conditions of God's blessings. Everybody wants to be blessed by God. Everybody wants to receive a blessing from God, but some of the blessings are conditional. Second Chronicles reminds us of a conditional blessing. It says... In 714, if, conditional clause, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's a conditional blessing. Most of us want to be blessed, but we forget that many of the blessings are conditioned on our obedience. Today we'll see that played out. That brings me to the fifth point. Great, late, great leaders make known the consequences of bad choices. <laughs> Great leaders make known the consequences of bad choices. It's good when we can offer blessings to you, but at the same time, there are consequences to disobeying God. 
Look at what he says in verse 16. It says, even now take your stand and see the great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Verse 17. He says, is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great and that you have and what you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking yourself for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Then all the people said, pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die for we have added to all of our sins by this evil of asking ourselves for ourselves a king. Great leaders make known the consequences of bad choices. Now in verse 17 he says, in verse 16 he says, take your stand and see what the Lord is going to do. Even though God has been faithful to them, they ask for a a, a king, and basically in asking for a king, they say, they're saying, we don't want you, God. We want what everybody else has. We want to be like everybody else. We don't want you. And he says, now take your stand. Here are the consequences of you having a desire for someone other than me. And by the way, that is idolatry. That is a breaking of the first commandment, to, thou shall have no other God before me. And you say, I don't have a God before you, but anything that you allow or anyone that you allow to sit in the place of God's throne, that is your idol. He says in verse, he tells him what he's going to do. What is he going to do? Verse 17. Is it not the wheat harvest? Now, the wheat harvest takes place in May to early June, late May to early June. He says, is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Now, to, the, to us, that might not be a big deal, but during that period, there was not typically rain during the wheat harvest time. He says, so I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Here are the consequences. Now, again, it's easy for us to read this, and it doesn't really strike us as strange. But when Samuel is saying to the people that I am going to pray to the Lord and he is going to send rain, that is strange. That would be almost like our December's. We not having any snow, but the sun is shining and flowers are out. It would be odd for us. For them, the time of the wheat harvest, which was late May to early June, there was very little rain. But here are the consequences. It says, I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. Samuel's letting them know that even though God has been faithful and he used Saul to give you a great victory, there's still consequences to bad decisions. When we make choices to disobey God, God gives us mercy, but at the same time, that does not take away the consequences of our choices. He says in verse 18, So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that, that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. They understood that this rain was God's wrath. It was his discipline. In fact, it says that they feared greatly the Lord as well as Samuel. 
This is a strange phenomenon during this time for it to be thunder and rain. They know that this is God's doing. And so how bad was this thunderstorm? Well, the text goes on to let us know how bad it was. The people thought they were going to die. This wasn't rain like it was yesterday at the March for Jesus. This was thunder and rain to the point where they thought that they were going to die. How do I know that? Verse 19, look. Then all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God, so that we may not die. They feel like they are going to die. This storm is so bad, and they understand that this storm is a consequence to their bad choice. And they say, for we have added all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. They get it. One of the things that we need to understand as believers, when we sin against God, we need to confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 8 says, if you say you have no sin, you lie and the truth is not in you. But if, conditional clause, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's a few principles that we can get from verses 16 through 19. First, the the people own the fact that they've made a bad decision to request a king. They own their sin. Secondly, they know God is not pleased with their choice. There's no speculation. They knew God's standard and they knew that they were not living up to it. And so now you know that the new, for now the New Testament believer, we of course know that there is no excuse for us sinning. We had a great Sunday school lesson this morning and a lot of discussion. As a believer in Jesus Christ, who is sealed with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit empowers the believer to live a righteous life. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit empowers the believer so that they're able to live a righteous life. But we still have the sin nature. We have this flesh, Romans chapter 7, Paul says, when I want to do right, evil is present on every hand. And listen, even though evil is present does not mean that we need to bow to evil. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that gave sight to the blind, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, lives in, abides in the life of the believer so that there is no excuse for the believer to sin. But if we, when we do sin or if we do sin, we have an advocate, we have someone who intercedes on our behalf. The Bible says in Romans 8, with groanings too deep for words. And so, though, so even though I am a, 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 a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, I still have to deal with the reality of this flesh. Paul, at the end of chapter 7, came to the same conclusion. He says, who will deliver me from this, this, this body of a bondage? He cries out to God and and he's exhausted because he understands the reality in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 that we who are believers, we who are, uh, who have been redeemed, we are no longer slaves to sin. 
He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? Of course not. We died to sin. And yet the reality is many believers still struggle with sin. This, I'm only addressing this because this came up in Sunday school this morning. So is a believer who's struggling with sin, are they, out, are they no longer a believer? The scriptures are clear. The ones that the Father has given to the Son, no one can pluck them out of the Father's hand. Listen, you're not even strong enough to jump out of the Father's hand. Now, we rejoice in the fact that we're saved and we're sealed until uh, Christ comes back. We cannot be lost, but because we cannot be lost, we need to make sure that we try to live a life that's pleasing to God because he purchased us with his blood. We do and live how we live out of gratitude for all that God has done for us. And yet there's still a struggle. There's a struggle in this flesh. The people here in Samuel's time, they understand that God is not pleased with their choice. And there are times when we know that we've walked out of bounds. And so what do we do when we walk out of bounds? We confess our sin. Let's not try to hide it. Let's not try to give it another name. Let's call it what it is. Let's own it. And let's confess it because the word is true that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we may have to still deal with the consequences. But listen, that doesn't separate us from the love of God. In Romans chapter 8, he says, what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Life can't separate us. Death tribulations, principality, no height, no depth, no, no other created being can separate us from God's love. And so that they know that God is not pleased with their choice. There's no speculation. They knew God's standard and they knew that they were not living up to it. And so we, as New Testament believers, we have, listen, the ability to live a righteous and holy life before God. All of us. And when, and the scripture says, when our brothers or sisters have fallen, Galatians 6 reminds us that we who are spiritual restore such a one. There are folk who are living with shame and guilt because of a decision and a choice that they made. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Romans chapter 8 reminds us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, we got to deal with the consequences, but you don't have to live a life of condemnation because you made a mistake. gives life to the verse that says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. They know that their choice is wicked, and they know that the storm is connected to their choice. Listen, as leaders, we don't do the people a favor when we don't tell them that they have offended a holy God. Do you understand that love is always married to truth? 
Let me say that again. Love is always married to truth. And you say, well, it's not my business. If you know that a brother or a sister that, that is living in a way that is beneath the level of mediocrity, you lovingly need to help them get to the place where God wants them to be. You say, well, doesn't the Bible say we ought not judge each other? Well, no, it doesn't say that. It says, judge not lest ye be judged. And then it talks about by the same standard that you judge other people, you're going to be judged by. These people know that the storm is connected to their choice. Love is a call to tell people the truth even when it's difficult. You know, I, um, as, a, as a pastor, I find myself in an odd position quite often. I am not the spiritual police, but when I know about things, I have to address it. And I'm going to be honest, in my, my flesh, I would rather not say anything. But as a leader, guess what? I am called as somewhat of a watchman on the wall. In fact, turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Look at verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, if I bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head." Verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself, but he, had taken, but he had taken warning, he would have delivered his life. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Look at verse 7. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. Do y'all get that? As pastors, as leaders, as disciple makers, it is our responsibility to tell people the truth in love. Warn them. Because if you don't, the scripture says their blood is on your hands. He goes on to say in verse 9, but if you on your part warn the wicked man to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. I used to say, I ain't scared of y'all. People told me that you need to stop saying that, Pastor, so I don't say it no more. 
But the reality is, I am afraid of God. I am afraid to not tell you the truth. I am afraid to lower the standard so that you can reach it. I'm afraid to stand before God and hear him say to me, you have not been faithful as a watchman. You have not been a good steward of your position. And I know that he's not going to cast me out into darkness, but he is going to judge me based on the fruitfulness of my life and my obedience to the call. And he will do the same for you. Because when he died on the cross, he purchased you with his blood and he puts you in the body of Christ for a purpose. And so you're going to stand before him also and give an account for all the things that you've done. And so here's the last thing. They knew that Samuel's prayer was a means to getting God to relent. God had a, had a history of being faithful to the people even when they were faithless. So they say to Samuel, listen, pray. <laughs> pray for your servants in verse 19 to the Lord your God so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking ourselves for ourselves a king. Great leaders are sensitive to God's voice. Great leaders lead with integrity. Great leaders convey the conditions of God's blessings. Great leaders make known the consequences of bad choices. And lastly, great leaders always call the people to a higher standard. Here at Rising Star, God has really, really blessed us. But we are not there yet. Paul says, listen, these things I do. I forget about what is behind me. And I press forward for the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. Listen, we don't get to a place where we have arrived. When we arrive, we'll be standing before him. Until then, we need to be pressing forward for the mark of the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. There is still a standard that must be obtained. And maybe you didn't reach it on yesterday, but God has given you the ability today to meet the standard. And then if you make it to tomorrow, you can't ride on yesterday's victories because the enemy is still uh, here to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible says that he is waiting like a lion, waiting to devour you. And so you must always be dependent on the Holy Spirit to empower you to live in victory for the day. Yesterday's victories are yesterday's. You need his grace and his mercy today. Samuel said, because he calls them to a higher standard. Samuel said to the people, after seeing this rain and this storm at an unusual time, they know that it is God. They, they own their sins. They, they realize that this storm is as a result of their rebellion. But Samuel said to the people, do not fear. He says, chill out. I know you're rebellious, you're scared, you need to be punished, you should be punished, but chill, God still loves you. He said to the people, do not fear, you have committed this evil, yet, and now he gives them some, some conditions, some things that they need to do. 
He says, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. What do you do when you acknowledge that you've walked away from God or you've sinned in an instant? What do you do to get back in right standing with God? That is a great question. How do I get back into fellowship with God? Well, Scripture tells us, confess your sin. If we do that, he is faithful and he will forgive us of our sins. And he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, well, it's that simple? Yep, it is really that simple. Now, what makes it more difficult is the enemy who is constantly there to remind you of what you did, he will try to make you uh, feel condemned for something that God has already forgiven you for. Listen to me. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If you're not careful, you're carrying the weight of your sin that God has already forgiven you for. And listen, who are you to not accept God's forgiveness? Who are you to say that, that God, your forgiveness is not enough? i got to still embrace this sin. And listen, God, when he has forgiven you, and you're going back over and over and asking him to forgive you, God is like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Didn't I tell you? That if you confess your sin and you did that, didn't I let you know that I was faithful and just and I will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness? So if I've cleansed you from all unrighteousness, what are you talking about? Listen to me, we've got to learn. Yes, yes, there are consequences to bad choices, but when God forgives us, he forgives us. He gives us a blank slate. Well, you say, well, I still, I got to deal with this sin. I got this child. I, I did this. I got to go to jail because I made a decision. Okay, those are the consequences, but know that God is with you. He promised to never leave you or forsake you. Don't listen. Don't let people look at you and cause you to feel condemned about your sin. God has got your back. He has forgiven you. You are accepted by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And listen, if you go to a church that won't accept you after you have sinned, you need to leave that church. In fact, that is not the church that Christ is building. Christ is taking broken, wounded people who have made poor choices in life, and he is restoring them. That's the God that I serve. That's the God that I serve. But we don't make provisions for the flesh. We don't continue sinning that grace might increase. We don't do that. Why? Because we died to sin. Why do we continue to live as slaves when God has set us free? Why do we carry the burden of our, 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 our past choices and when God has freely forgiven us? In fact, he died on the cross for your sins. Listen, God is faithful even when we're not. He gives them a condition. He says, listen, don't turn aside from following the Lord. I know you feel bad about your sin. That's great. You should feel bad about it. But guess what? When you ask God for forgiveness, he has forgiven you. Live forgiven. Jesus, listen, says this, come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest unto your soul. Stop carrying around all of the sin of your past. If he's forgiven you, lay it at his feet. Remind the devil when he comes and to remind you what you did. Remind them what God told you, that you are more than a conqueror. You are forgiven. But don't turn aside from following the Lord. But sir, listen, but listen, knowing how gracious God is, that ought to give you more fire to serve him with your whole heart. Listen, you, listen as, as, as God pursues us and chases after us, we ought to be chasing after him knowing that we don't deserve to be redeemed, but he redeemed us anyway. And so it's a call to living a high standard. It calls us to faithful living because he is faithful. We ought to be faithful towards him. And it's also a call to zealous service. Listen, it's not the time to take the background. You want to sit in the back, you want to try to be uh, hidden because you sin and everybody knows. Hmm, that's not the time to take a back seat. That's the time to be more zealous in serving God. Look at verse 21. He says, you must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. This is a call to undistracted worship. You know, one of the things that, um, and I, I had the same disease for a long, long time. I'm 54 years old, and... I just recently, in, in the last few years, been delivered from people-pleasing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you care more about what other people think about you than what God cares about you. Don't turn aside. Don't look for things to pacify you in your place of grief. Don't make, listen, don't put yourself in a place where you are condemning yourself. But instead, worship God. Thank him for what he's done. And worship him. Worship him with your life. Pursue him with everything that you have. Why? Verse 22. For the Lord will not abandon his people. He just won't do it. As parents, we have times when our kids don't live up to the standard that we want them to live up to, but they're still our kids. We still love them. Amen. The Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name. <laughs> you know, my, my son, I'm, I'm so proud of him. Even if he was out there doing stuff that I wasn't pleased with, he's still a Donaldson. He still carries my name. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you may have fallen, you may have uh, scraped your knee up, you may have done some things that's not pleasing, but you still carry his name. You are still his child. And he won't abandon you on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Just let that marinate. God was pleased to make you a part of his family. You ought to have a little bit more swagger about yourself. 
I want everybody walking out with their chest out. You got to walk a little bit different knowing who you are. God protects his reputation and his people benefit from his character. My dad, listen, my dad is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. There is nothing that is too hard for my dad. My dad specializes in things that seem impossible. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. The Bible says even if I make my bed in hell, but he is there with me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I know that you think that I ain't got a whole lot going on, but I'm here to tell you today that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you got it going on. And you need to live like you got it going on. Moreover, he says, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. If you've messed up, if you've walked away, if you've sinned and you whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Confess it and begin to serve him, he says, with all of your heart, for consider what great things. Think about the things that he has done for you. Verse 25. But, <laughs> if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. Love is always married to truth. Great leaders do what they do as unto the Lord, regardless of the response of the people. Leaders are people who have feelings just like everyone else, and you need to be praying for your leaders because your leaders are praying for you. Great leaders are sensitive to God's voice. They lead with integrity. They remind the people of God's faithfulness. They convey the conditions of God's blessings. They make known the consequences of bad choices. And they call the people to a higher standard. Live up to the standard that God has called you to. You are his son, you are his daughter, you are more than an overcomer. Do not live as a victim because he has made us victorious in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for this reminder Lord, you have called each and every one of us to lead in some capacity. Give us a sensitivity to your voice. Give us a desire to lead others with integrity. Help us to remember all the things that you have done for us, where you have brought us from battles that we lost and you picked us up and you dusted us off and you put us back out there. You equipped us to be victorious because of your own great name. We thank you for your faithfulness, your loyal love, 
that pursues us even when we are rebellious. Lord, help us to know that you are always going to do your part. Give us the conviction to walk in obedience according to your word. We know that we can do it because of your spirit. Lord, we know that there are consequences for bad choices and decisions. But help us to remember that there is nothing that will separate us from your love. Yes, whom the Lord loves, he, he disciplines, he chastises, but you do that in love. Help us to see your heart, even in discipline. And lastly, Lord, help us to call others to a higher standard. And more than that, help us to live up to the standard that you set. Knowing that there are others that are looking at us. And we might be the only Bible that others are reading or will ever read. So help us to live righteously in this present age, knowing that there'll be a time when darkness will come and no man will be saved when you come back. Lord, help us to make eternal, eternal decisions on a day-to-day -day basis to honor you and to serve you with all of our hearts. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together. Perhaps God is calling you to a deeper relationship with him. If you're here and this is for a believer and you desire a deeper relationship with him, there's something that has been in your life that has been plaguing you and is keeping you from fully committing to him. Today, I want you to know that you can walk out of here with some swagger. You don't have to walk out here the same way you came in. You don't have to be a victim because you are not a victim as a believer. So if you're here and it's your desire to go deeper in your walk with Christ as a believer, I want you to come forward. Second invitation is for those who, who never received Jesus Christ as their Lord. And you believe that he died on the cross. And you believe that he was buried. And you believe that God raised him from the dead. And you want to commit to Jesus Christ as Lord. I want you to come forward. conference room will be open in the back at the end of service. If you have come to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, I want you to just pray this prayer with me. Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I have a need for salvation because I can't work my way to heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I believe that he was buried and I believe that God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. And so God, I place my faith in you alone for salvation. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit that empowers me to live a righteous life. 
Father, I pray that you would put me in close contact with someone that will help me learn my new identity in Christ so that I might walk in a way that is pleasing to my King. To those that have come and they are already committed, they've already responded to the gospel, but they they want to recommit and they want to go deeper in their walk with you. God, I thank you for giving them a heart of flesh. Your word says you will exchange the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. In the words of David, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, you know what it is that is keeping them from fully committing to you. Whatever it is, God, I pray that they would lay it at your feet. Your invitation is still extended even now. Come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so you will take their burden and give them yours. For your burden is easy and light. So take the heaviness. Take the heaviness away from them that when they walk from this altar, they will experience a supernatural peace that even they can explain themselves. God, we honor you. We thank you for being in our midst. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to go back to the conference room. I want to ask as we dismiss today, if you will do so in a state of reverence. You don't have to leave immediately. If you need to spend some time here with God at the altar, at your seat, I want you to do that. And so just, we want to give everybody a time to just commune with God and leave here knowing that nothing will separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.